Children's chat part. Come on, Kareen. You're somebody's kid. <clears throat> All right, group. What are the parts of the body that we've talked about so far? Uh, ears. Ears. What? Uh, heart. Heart. Your eye. You know what? I did a brown one because you girls both have brown eyes. No, she has hazel eyes. Hazel brown. Come on. Give me a break. <laughs> You're out of here. <laughs> what else we talk about? Oh, ears. Ears? How did we talk about ears? Right? We did a cup. Cup string. A pitchfork. You weren't here for that one. Thank you. What was this one? Your hands. Remote control fingers. What's this about? It's just a distraction. Oh, we're going to talk about what today? What's our topic for today? Our voice. Our voice. Who has a voice? Everybody. Everybody, pretty well. How about this? How would life be different if you could not talk? If you couldn't talk verbally, how would you talk? Yes, yeah, sign language. Or an iPad. Thank you very much. Again, you're going to get sent back to your room. What, about, what if nobody could speak? Would that make life a little different? If nobody could speak? A very silent place. But it would change us because... As humans, we're made to communicate, and we speak, and most of us here speak English. But that's not the only language, is there? French. That's one we're learning in school. Our school also teaches German and Spanish and Japanese. You can take classes in any of them. Is everyone's voice the same or different? Is it different? Could you tell who it is without being able to see them? Can you? If somebody called you on the phone, you, you can't see them. Do you know who it is? Do you know their voice? You know, if not, you ask who it is. Are you? Right, so somebody that you don't know, you don't know their voice. But if your grandma or grandpa calls, do you know who it is without call display? <laughs> if you know the voice, you know who it is. Would you know my voice? Probably. You hear it enough sometimes. Where does your voice come from? In your throat. Where in your throat? Can you find it? Talk a little bit and feel till it vibrates. Right here. Is that where it vibrates? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> We've looked at some of these medical pictures. Ew, that's somebody's face cut in half. Well, it's actually just a drawing. Do you see how big the tongue is as a muscle right over here? Yeah, it is, in your sinuses, and all this had, runs air, air down to here, and right there, that's where you felt it, that's where your vocal fold is. Trachea or trachea, we could go either way. Using your voice for ministry. So how does your voice actually work? Do you like balloons? Can you make a noise with this? I'm better at it. <laughs> Did you say make it fart? <laughs> Whose kid is this? 
that's how it makes us up. Is, is that how your voice works? It just... No, it's not how it works. So where's that air coming from? Your mouth. No. Nope. Your lungs, right? Ready? So how is that like your voice? You've got, don't, don't sing to me. Let it go, that's a different song. So your lungs are pushing air and your vocal cords. They change, which changes the sound of it. So what you can do is you can change the air inside your lungs. Your vocal cords, that's what they do. They vibrate because you're pushing air past them. What's in this? It's a type of air, but is it the same air that I pushed into here? So what do you know about helium? Are you? It's lighter. So would it change your voice? Oh, it, oh, yes, it will. Which is a little thing that we'll do after church, okay? After services. Naomi's not here, so we can probably get away with it. <laughs> what is ministry? We've talked about the body and ministry. What's ministry? What is ministry? Okay, teaching about God. Do you see our banners up here? Which one of them says ministry? So what does it say with the little words above it? So what is ministry? It's when we help others. We've talked about helping others because your heart wants to help others. You use your eyes to see needs, and that helps you help others. Use your hands to touch people's lives. That helps you help others. And your voice. How does your voice help you help others? How did Jesus use his voice to help other people? Are you? What do you think? Um, he okay. He communicated with people and gave them advice. They asked him questions. He gave them answers. Was that helpful? Yes. Jesus helped people by talking to them and helping them understand scripture. How else did he help people with his voice? Do you remember in the Bible there were several times where Jesus would say to somebody, be healed? Did it work? Yeah, just by saying that, they could be healed. How can you use your voice to help others? Okay, that's the language you're going to use probably. How are you going to use that to help other people? Okay, if somebody's hurting, you can talk to somebody and help them feel better. If you step up fast, you use your voice to help them understand it. Okay, when you're reading something or you're trying to figure something out, you can help somebody by explaining things. That's how you can use your voice to be helpful. Talking to people, listening to people, providing information that we need. There's lots of ways that we can use our voice to be helpful to others around us, and Jesus shows us that example. Now, remember when we did this, here's your last bribe, okay? Next week, we're not doing... This is cinnamon hearts. If you want some cinnamon hearts, because what did I bring when we talked about hearts last time? No, a turkey heart. A turkey heart. So this will be a little better. Do you want some? Are you? Do you like cinnamon hearts? I like some more. There you go, girls. We can use our voice to help in ministry, to help other people, because 
saying please and thank you, being grateful, giving instruction, being polite, all of those ways. Are you up here? This is a front row thing. That's how we can use our voice to be helpful to others. All right, you guys can all go back to your seats. We may be doing this later. As we continue to think about being the voice of Jesus, the reminder that I want to start with is that our purpose is to follow Christ as his disciples. We've looked at each of these banners as we've gone along, each of these themes, and they all interconnect. Evangelism is connected to ministry as it is to discipleship, as it is to fellowship, and we're going to start a new series on worship, but they all connect together, and so discipleship is a key aspect of that as well. As the church, we're the body of Jesus, so we use our bodies like Jesus used his. We are at work at emulating his characteristics so that over time we look more like him, we act more like him, we think more like him, and we speak more like him. Each day and each choice brings us deeper into an amazing transformation. Today we're going to look at four aspects of Jesus' speech that we need to emulate as we're disciples of his today. When I consider the speech of Jesus, looking at the opportunity to, to read the Gospels and to, to see God communicating with people around him, it seems that he had four major topics that he spoke about, different ways that he addressed the same sorts of ideas. Jesus' speech was helpful to people. Would you, do you see that in the Gospels? He was helpful to people. When he spoke to them, it was a benefit to their lives. Can I say that mine always is? I think more than it used to be, but not always. Jesus' speech drew attention to sin. But how often do I do this? How often do I acknowledge the sin in my own life and say, you know, you know better. Why do you do what you do? And when I speak to others to say, do you need some help overcoming that? It seems like that pattern is still there. Jesus' speech was grounded in the word. So that when we communicate with one another, we talk about Scripture. We talk about God at work within us. Jesus, as he lived his life, he made Scripture relevant. He explained its purpose. He explained its transformational nature. He saw it from a unique way, and he took his time to speak to people about Scripture. And it was controlled. Controlled in the sense that Jesus knew what to say, when to say it, and how to say it. Those are disciplines that we learn from reading through Scripture, that God expects those same aspects of us today. To know what to say, to know when to say that, and to know how to say what we need to be speaking about. Just as with every area of life, Jesus sets the supreme example. He sets the supreme example of proper speech, and when we go into the Gospels, we see God using his voice to minister to others. In many of the familiar passages that we know quite well, in John chapter 4, 4 through 26, that's the, uh, the, the time when Jesus is speaking to the Samaritan woman. But in that background, the Jews and Samaritans not only didn't get along but they really didn't like each other. They didn't trust one another. And it became one about spiritual superiority. We're closer to God than you are. God loves us and not you. And so that becomes an element that reads into the story. Jesus also is speaking to a Samaritan woman. Well, Jewish mindset is that women were not honored by God. That's kind of the short sign of it. There's several different Jewish quotes that made the same sort of mention. And so Jesus, speaking to a Samaritan woman, makes the story come alive in a different way. She's at the well, but at what time of day is she at the well? At midday. That's not the, tom the common time to go and get water, is it? You're there because nobody else is there. So you have a Jewish woman who's an outcast. 
But does Jesus use his speech to minister? Does Jesus have a conversation that changes this woman's life? We've read of the other parts of the body. What does he see? What does he hear? What's in his heart that would change this situation so that when he spoke, it becomes a blessing? Were there parts of the passages, because we know it well enough, but to think through how it connects to this? Well, oh, and Dick just left. Did you read that passage? It was pretty good. In chapter 4, verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And then it has even the brackets in your Bible. It says, For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And the verse that was supposed to stay on there is verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. He sets this up so he has a dialogue. They could have just ignored one another, but he sets it up to have a conversation that really gets to the core matter of things. If you knew who it is that you're speaking to, you would have asked me, and I would have given you living water. Changes an everyday conversation into something of spiritual significance. This leads to a confession about marital relationships, her living status, questions about what God really expects from people in worship. It wasn't just getting a drink of water, was it? But sometimes just talking to people when you're down getting the mail together, when you're at the grocery store, or you're just visiting over this, leads to big topics. Then Jesus declared in verse 26, then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. That's John chapter what? Four. It's the first time that Jesus identifies himself as the Messiah. Who does he identify himself to? A Samaritan woman outcast. Why? Because the conversation led itself that way. Because God knew what needed to be said, and what needed to be heard. Jesus used his voice to help her. He could have used his hands, but she really didn't need a healing. He could have used his eyes and just said, you know what, Samaria needs more preachers. He could have used his heart and said, man, I wouldn't want to be a woman. But what does he use? He uses his voice. And that act of ministry changes her life. The conversation changes her life, and it eventually, in a very few verses, changes the lives of all those around her. He knew what she needed to hear, and they soon got to the heart of the matter. We need to bring people the good news. Amen? We need to bring people the good news. We need to get beyond the superficial matters of life and have time to talk to people in conversations that have eternal significance. That's using your voice as an act of ministry. Jesus' speech not only helped people, but a way that it helped people is it drew attention to sin. And then said there's a different way to live. Not just pointing fingers at people and saying, don't do that, God doesn't love that, but talking to people about sin in their life as it is a real item and then helping them through it. He did this with the woman at the well and her living status and showing that God's view of marriage is not the same as the cultural view. He most often drew attention to sin when he exposed the sin of the Pharisees and he also helped his followers know knew what God expected of them. In Matthew chapter 5, 21 through 23, Because really, the whole Sermon on the Mount is Jesus saying, this is what sin is. You've understood it this way. You've heard that it was said, but I say, here's what I meant when I said that back in the Old Testament, back under the sacrificial law. Here's what I meant. Here's how you live it. Although the Sermon on the Mount includes a variety of topics, a lot of them connect to viewing sin. He defines what sin is for a kingdom of believers, for a new kingdom, because the cultural and religious definitions fell short. Is that not the same today? Can you get behind the cultural definition of sin? 
that says there isn't any? <laughs> Can you really agree with that? What about religious definitions that say it's just a mistake? It's not your fault because it's not your choice. Well, we've been studying James. Sin is a choice. You choose, and that leads to sin. Jesus announces this and clarifies it and has these discussions, and they become recorded. Remember, all of these were oral, weren't they? The Sermon on the Mount was an oral sermon. It wasn't a, hey, read this pamphlet. They heard him speak. There's a section in here that can become confusing. It's one of the ones about speech. So I just selected this one because it's one that you know. But think of how much it really says about controlled speech too. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Is that true? Is that still true? That carries through, right? That's a principle of God. Murder leads to judgment. And they understood that, but as long as I haven't murdered, I'm not subject to judgment. So Jesus then says, but here's what I mean by that. See, it becomes a sin long before it becomes murder. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Is that different than murder? Everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Racket, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool... Now, here's a term that we know. You fool, the Greek in there is moros, which is the root of the word moron. You moron. Will be in danger of the fire of hell. Jesus says that speech is very important. Because long before you get to killing somebody, where do you start? If you don't know how to control that anger... That anger can lead to you speaking about somebody, and you might use a term like raka, which was an Aramaic term and one that we don't use. That meant you have no moral value. You are good for nothing. Does God agree with that? Is anybody of no moral value? Now their, their behavior, their actions are going to lead to judgment, but everybody is of moral value. So it starts in the terminology, in the speech. And proper speech helps us. We have to value people to help them. Anger starts the path to murder. Jesus let people know what God expected of them. We need to help correct people's inaccurate view of sin as well as help them. We need to help people change. Now what about this? Just pointing out sin does not help people change. Is that true? Just saying that's a sin, don't do that, doesn't help people change. It's a part of that because if you don't acknowledge it as sin, there will be no desire to change anyways. But it's going beyond that. Jesus used his speech to say, that's going to separate you from God or is separating you from God. Here's what we can do about it. Speech that becomes helpful. A third aspect of Jesus' speech that we need to emulate is found in the truth that his speech was grounded in the Word of God. And there are key events, the most difficult times in Jesus' life, where we see him quoting Scripture. Matthew records seven instances where Jesus uses the phrase, It is written. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 through 4, 11, it's one of the great examples for Jesus using that term. Once Jesus is baptized, he begins his ministry. He is tempted by the devil. Jesus uses the Bible in context to defeat Satan and temptation. But is that our pattern for defeating temptation? Do we know the Word of God enough to apply it as we're being tempted? Or do we enjoy the grace of God after we fail? Jesus knew the Word of God enough to apply it during the temptation. This, by the way, is after 40 days of not eating. That would make me grumpy. How about you? 
40 days of fasting, are you really going to be in the mood for a debate? No. So the Word of God had better be pretty deep within you because in verse 8 it says, And the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I'll give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended to him. We need to put the word of God into our hearts and our heads so that we can speak the truth of God's word accurately and naturally. It's a good time to brush up on those passages that we half quote and see if we're actually saying what the Bible says to remember what the context is of the verses that we like to go to. If his word is active in our thinking, then it will be active in our speech. Reading and learning the word makes a big difference in your speech so that we can minister to people, so it becomes more natural in our conversation because we're being transformed in our thoughts. His speech was helpful. His speech drew attention to sin. It was grounded in the word, and it was always controlled. Jesus knew when to speak and what to say and how to say it. In Matthew chapter 9, 1 through 8, records Jesus choosing his words very carefully. There are numerous examples of this. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Some men brought him a paralytic lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or to say, Get up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And we, then the story continues. Then he said to the paralytic, Get up, take your mat, and go home. And the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and praised God, who had given such authority to men. So this is a healing, but what does it have to do with controlled speech? Do you see that in the, in the text here? Because here's an example where he could have just spoken the person healed, but he didn't. He didn't heal him. He says, your sins are forgiven. But what's going to be the evidence of that? How are they going to know whether his sins are forgiven or not? Nobody would, right? There's going to be, that's between him and God. So which is easier to say? I could tell this man, your sins are forgiven, and there's no evidence of it at all. But so that you would believe that my words have actual value, I'll tell him, get up and walk. And when he does that, are you going to doubt the first part? Because if I told him his sins are forgiven, and I told him, get up and walk, and the disease left and he got up and walked, could I not, did I not also forgive him of his sin? So he knew when to break the regular order of things. To say, I know what's in your heart. So I'm going to say it this way instead of that way. Jesus used his voice to help people. He used his voice to heal people. He used his voice to create the world. That's pretty powerful. Jesus knew when to challenge people, and he also knew when to let it go. He didn't address everybody all the time. He wasn't just a sin seeker. He wasn't just, oh, you people, you just frustrate me so much. He knew when to laugh and enjoy life, and he knew when to talk about important things. He knew when to defend himself and how to get to the heart of the matter. He knew when a woman at the well wasn't just looking for water. He knew when to say, you know what, you've probably got big questions about worship. And she did. And he answered those questions and she runs back into town and she tells everybody, come and hear the man that knows my life. And they do. They listen to her and they come back. The last few hours of his life show great control of the speech, don't they? 
We read about him in the temptation, but what about at the crucifixion? Did Jesus control his speech then? Yeah. A lot. There are very few words that Jesus says going to the cross. Very few. I am thirsty. Very few times that he actually speaks. And when he does, they're all significant. He didn't defend himself. He agreed with Pilate. He spoke to his father and his followers. While he's speaking with Pilate, he again gets back to the big issues. Pilate says, what is truth? And he says, here I am. Do you want to talk about this? i got time for philosophy. I'm just getting crucified in the next few minutes. But if you want to talk about it, we'll go into it. Jesus uses his speech constantly as a form of ministry. The Bible says a lot more about the need to watch our speech. It's an area of life that we can always be working on. James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. is a great passage about the tongue being controlled. There are a number of proverbs which speak about speech, the power and the poison of the tongue. But this passage in Ephesians chapter 4, through chapter 5 and verse 4, it's transformational because it provides us a hope and a reminder about the impact that our speech has. It's very pointed when it starts with, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Does that sound pretty absolute? So in order to apply this passage, you need to know what wholesome talk is and what isn't wholesome. So he describes that. He defines it. How do you know what is appropriate speech? Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So wholesome speech is that that is according to people's needs, and it benefits those who listen. You do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. He then asks us to, commands us to, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality, or any kind of impurity or greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be, he gets back to speech, nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, and coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. It's a powerful passage about what we need to get rid of and what we need to replace it with. What will the series look like with you, for you, from now on as you follow Jesus? Do you understand ministry a little differently? Are you thinking how ministry relates to your body, that your body needs to connect to ministry? We follow the example of Jesus. Does it give you empowerment to say, you know what, I'm a part of our church body as well. There's ways that I can be here to help people. How are you using your body in ministry? Your physical, tangible, the items that God has given you. How do you use that for ministry? Not just thinking about ministry, but doing ministry, helping others. How is our congregation being the body of Jesus to each other? Remember, I pointed that out right at the beginning. Ministry starts in the church. It's one of the reasons to be a part of a congregation is to give and receive and to help one another. How is our congregation being the body of Jesus to each other and also in the community? How are we known as a helpful place? What can you do to make your speech patterns more helpful to others? Here's my big reminder. Get past the small talk. That one difference is going to make an eternal difference for somebody. If you just get past the small talk and talk about big things. It's going to mean dealing with sin in your own life and the lives of others. 
How can you draw attention to sin while showing that you love the sinner? How can you be an encouragement? How can you provide a place of hope and a discussion of transition? How can reading the Word become more a part of your speech? How do you translate that side into that side? How can you grow in controlling your tongue and using it for the benefit of others? See, this is an area of growth. It's not something that's just going to become immediate, but you can learn to speak differently. And, like a ventriloquist, you can sound more like Jesus. You're not impersonating him. He's living in you. He's changing your speech. So more and more, you sound more like Jesus. You talk more like him because you think more like him. And that's one of the ways that the world knows who we're following. 